this presentation is going to be different. I think uh, some of you may be looking at the Titan and thinking what got combustion to do with clean tech. I think perhaps I'd, for the next 10 minutes we're going to call it cleaner tech rather than clean tech. A lot of people associate renewable energy with uh, a cleaner technology. And uh, I'm going to try and convince you that uh, there is a scope to actually clean uh, the existing technology without further investments in it. And there's good reasons for it. So uh, here's a fact. No matter what we're going to do, solar, wind, whatever it is, we're still going to be using solar fuels for the next 20 years or so. Mainly because even with accelerated implementation of renewable energy, we still need fossil fuels just to cater for the growth of the required energy. So uh, fossil fuel is going to be here for the next 20 years. And hence, if we're going to cut our emission, we need to do something about the efficiency in particular. So here is the rates, 35% oil, then 25% or so coal and, and gas. And obviously, Australia is a heavy user of all these sources. Next is, uh, no matter how much solar energy and wind you have, for mineral processing, which is important for our uh, uh, economy, you need high temperatures. Uh, and uh, solar energy or wind is not going to give you this. Yes, it can generate electricity for us, but we'll still need to burn fossil fuels to be able actually to do mineral processing. If, when, if we want to process our iron ore, or we're going to have calcimers or kilns or whatever. And hence, uh, ignoring the elephant in the room uh, is not a good strategy, I think. Another thing, too, as part of the uh, uh, strategy to mitigate CO2, uh, it, it is expected that we're going to make 20% increase in efficiency to actually reduce our CO2 emission. So if we're going to do that, we need to have technology that will help us actually achieve this reduction. Exhaust gas recirculation is one thing. Uh, waste uh, heat recovery is another. Or what I'm going to talk to you about, flame oxidation, is another technology which actually can get us there. So what is it? Well, I'll spare you all the jargon. Simply, we're taking the exhaust gases, we're circulating back into the furnace. Why is this good? It actually creates an environment where the fuel can burn without needing ignition, or what's called auto-ignition as such. Look at these pictures in here. Here's a furnace, 20 kilowatt furnace, which I built, and I'm happy to show people here at Tibetan. I start with a normal flame that we all know about. Imagine this is the smaller scale, it's just a, a lighter in a way. After an hour or so, this furnace is going to be at a temperature of around 800, 850 degrees. And the only thing I do is I take the fuel from the center where it is now in here, and I distribute it to four jets in the surrounds. That's the only thing I do. I don't touch anything else, rather the flow rates or anything, anything else. So everything remains the same, except that now I'm distributing the fuel differently. Now, what do you have in the last picture in there? You see that the flame disappears. However, the walls are still glowing red, yeah? So uh, what happened in there? Well, we're still having a reaction happening. The fuel is being consumed. Uh, yet, I can't see a flame. So the energy is released, and there's no flame. Magic, all right. Well, it's called flameless, and that it's a reaction without a flame. Now, those who know a little bit about uh, physics, uh, it's basically the photon emissions at lower temperatures disappear, as, sim as simple as that. So why is this good? Why is this good? Well, it's good because now uh, what I have is a volumetric reaction. The reaction is happening in the whole volume rather than a small thing that's happening in here. So look how the temperature here is lower than actually where it is here. Here we're talking about around 2,000 degrees, while here the temperature is down to 600. Now imagine you have uh, something you're trying to heat. What you want is actually a uniform heat distribution. So in this furnace, the difference between the temperature and the bottom and the top is 50 degrees. The fluctuation in the temperature is no more than 50 degrees. So I have a whole volume which actually is at almost a uniform temperature. Okay, well, the temperature is lower. You could see here that actually there was a dimming of the light implying the temperature is slightly lower. Yes, it is. The difference is, though, instead of it peaking somewhere and lower, it's actually all distributed. Now, what matters at the end of the day is efficiency. In other words, if you're talking about this furnace, what is the temperature of the exhaust? If the exhaust gas is at a lower temperature, that means I'm utilizing more of the energy, isn't it? I'm not chucking it out to the atmosphere. 
Wasted, waste energy is actually a big issue in the industry. And hence what we have in here is higher uh, uh, radiation flux, 30% higher radiation flux. So out of the same amount of fuel I'm feeding into this, I'm getting 30% more energy. And what do I do? Took the fuel from the center, put it on the side. Now, there's, <laughs> what did that say? Wait, there's more. Uh, low pollution. NOx in particular, which is NO1, NO2, is one of the major contributors to smog. And the EPA put a lot of regulations these days to actually uh, regulate the emission of NOx. Now, because the temperature is not fluctuating up high and below a certain level, we're actually not producing NOx. So we gain 30% more. We reduced NOx by almost 80%. Uh, that's win-win, isn't it? I mean, in certain uh, other industries, they were spraying water at the flame to cool it down such that no knocks up. I mean, the last thing you want is actually to cool your flame because that's obviously reduce your efficiency. So what we're getting here is high efficiency, low pollution, and uniform temperature. And uniform temperature implying a better product quality. So I built this furnace, 20 kilowatt, instrumented, and I was able to run it on all sorts of gaseous fuels as well as some solid fuels too. And imagine you're putting sawdust into this furnace and actually the flame disappears. You can't see it. It goes in, there's quick uh, uh, devolatilization, the thing disappears and the furnace is still red hot. And the emission is still low, which is important. So we have 80% reduction in NOx. You could see, I have the monitor sitting on the exhaust in there. You could see it happening in here. And as you switch the, the fuels around, actually things go down. And it's quite remarkable, in fact, uh, with this very small change. Uh, some examples of the research we did in there. 30% reduction, uh, increase in, uh, in thermal efficiency. You know, you talk about lots of technologies. Well, again, 2% in here and 3% in there. 30% increase. This is a substantial win in a way, which means then any investment in infrastructure is actually going to pay off big time, especially that you don't have to worry, worry about emission. So, uh, and this is coming from what I call higher uh, heat flux, uh, obviously, you could then don't have to put as much fuel to process the same thing, or you could even build your furnace smaller uh, to achieve the same outcome. And I don't want to bore you with all the research, but believe me, there's a lot of papers that went out of this a bit before so we reached this conclusion. The other good thing is it's retrofitting, in that you don't have to demolish everything and start from scratch. It's actually something that you could retrofit into your existing furnaces, your existing processes, and it has been implemented in a lot of technologies uh, worldwide, from boilers to furnaces to heaters to a lot of things. Status, well, it's a proven technology with many examples of industrial success. There are opportunities to gain substantial benefits with limited in investments. And the way we need to do it, obviously, we need to look at the pilot scale. We need to do some retrofit, which can give you low carbon uh, uh, emission. I like to use this, uh, this figure. Actually, I, I, it was an eye opener for me. I mean, there's a lot of I'm not an economist, don't know much about uh, commercialization and so on. Uh, but I look at this and say, okay, well, this is what uh, experts uh, talk about policies for supporting low carbon technology. And every time I want to assess a technology, I say, where do I sit on this, on this curve? And you could see it's actually a nice curve. So sometimes you are here and you could actually slip back to. So where I would put this technology is, is somewhere around here. And that. Uh, uh, in terms of where it is to become mature technology in terms of where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to implement it tomorrow. However, this, the height of this curve is variable quite substantially between one technology to another. You know, I, uh, two weeks ago, uh, there was no uh, price on carbon in a way. Now, suddenly, the whole sort of uh, parameters have changed. Perhaps it becomes more. So climbing up much, much quicker than actually uh, we usually expect it to. Um, this is most of what I have. In fact, uh, uh, just a quick word, uh, perhaps advertisement for what uh, Dr. John Barham is going to do in the afternoon, is that talk about uh, what our Center of Energy Technology is trying to do is actually making a real impact rather than small incremental change in technology and coming and saying renewables is great, but we still want to use combustion, less integrative. And he's going to talk about how a, a, a using a hybrid approach is actually a good way of uh, integrating or getting the best out of renewables to uh, capitalize on our infrastructure and build for the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>